That's the Miller's analogy test, you'll probably know, is the one that says bird is to air as fish is to water. And clearly, you can see in this case that stilettos are more of an engineering feat than a common bridge because the human is much bigger than the car. Each pair of shoes goes through the force of a typhoon or a hurricane simply going to work or going out for the evening. Our genre of footwear is a great intersection to study things because it mixes the engineering challenges and then throws in something subjective like fashion. We tend not to overcomplicate things because things are so complex already. And that's really how I looked at sustainability. I didn't want to address it because what was on the table in terms of solutions would likely cause me headaches or my business to lose some margin. But then I noticed something was happening, and now I welcome it. Something sustainable until it becomes so exploited that it no longer is of any use. Back-ended solutions like recycling or repurposing, they often reduce the quality of the second generation and cost more money in power, energy, and resources to produce. The, the later generations often don't last very long. Change usually happens when we need it most, when we accept it and modify all the relationships, the ones between the products, consumption, manufacturing, and the entire ecosystem. At face value, most of the recent solutions address the symptoms and not the disease. They're mostly presented as the ends justify the means, dark motivation, or even a hard road ahead. They're a very top-down strategy with little regards of how they, must disrupt, they might disrupt our lives or even create more complexity. Then there's the quick fix marketing gimmick, the path of least resistant. That's a, it's suspiciously e easy to subscribe to. Neither of those options does anything to really move the needle. But how exactly can the future change without us being forced or coerced into doing it? It won't happen by any specific scheme or by any specific mandate, but a natural occurrence that happens in our economic cycles. And in order to understand we're going, where we're going, we actually have to understand where we've been. For the last 30 years, we've been using simple templates of growth and expansion. Globalism and corporatism brought us lots of it, mainly for the sake of profit and efficiency. I can be best articulate this using footwear, but it's all something you can understand because we all live through it. I often feel like a time traveler because when I started my career, it was the end of the last cycle, the one before this one. It was a dis dinosaur where everything was decentralized. The product had endless scope, breadth, and range. It was all very less efficient in operation, but it provided a better commodity for the consumer. Shoes had so much of a longer lifespan. The peripheral businesses built around it weren't there to control, restrict, or grow it, but were there to nurture their client and the product. There were things like, just to give you a little indication, there were things like shoe repair and shoe shining. When was the last time anybody in this room, especially if you're on the younger side, had a shoe repaired or shine? Probably never. We now simply throw them away, buy new, and believe they're being fully recycled or dealt with on the back end. We soon went from the local shop to the regional store to the regional retailer and then the national retailer, and we finally arrived at the global brand. Even the internet, which was touted to be the great disruptor and equalizer, quickly adapted to the same model. When the news cycle came in, it was welcomed. After all, consolidation and globalization brought us cheaper options. Styling options soon narrowed, as did the sizing, variety, and materials. It even changed the product. You now had to design product that fit the masses. And that affected the autonomy and the customer's value. Service slowly became non-existent. Conformity had reached its narrowest vector. 
the final point where the product becomes entirely compromised by the system. Products now look so similar, and if you don't believe me, just simply take the logo off of anything. It looks basically the same. Today, we have so much more of less. So much is added on into the chain that isn't product related to the point where it's offset any of the gains originally given to us by globalization or, or consolidation. We feel better with our regulations, social compliance, um, environmental requirements, but we really have no idea how they work or if they're actually being done effectively. Entire peripheral industries have emerged to navigate and remove us from any involvement. Few of them bring any added value, and it's a never-ending cycle of the product being gutted to compromise for the system. We've lost sight that the product, customer, and requirements should be at the center. We think they'll simply comply, and the customer will continue to accept less for more. The easiest way to illustrate, sorry I'm brushing through the slides here. The easiest way to illustrate the major change happening is funnels are about to turn into shower heads. And the market is about to become autonomous once again. Some of the most relevant and effective tools that are happening are in automation and 3D printing. A while back, one of the latest geek gadgets emerged and I had to have one. 3D printing became available to the product, and like any hobbyist, I bought one. I did, I did what many did, I, I tried to learn, but honestly, along with many other hobbyists, it collects dust in my corner today. I had neither time or patience to master it. Months passed, and then something really remarkable happened. My old antiquated heel supplier who made wood heels suddenly was offering a new service and it happened to involve 3D printing. He had mastered it out of necessity, which trumped my hobbyist incentive to learn it. Although it was slightly more expensive, it provided far more accurate standards in quicker time with far less correction or waste. Then soon, another surprise. During COVID, with most of the mass production shut down and without much to do, I begrudgingly attended a tour of machinery suppliers. I was amazed when I saw the advances firsthand. It was like a caveman seeing fire for the first time. Tons of smart machinery. One in particular replaced thousands of silk screen frames and the chemicals used in printing production. You could throw any pattern cut in any random order on a production line, different, equal, color variations, anything, and the electric eye would identify it and mark it and get it ready for laser cutting. Solutions are slowly integrating into the production process from the bottom up with absolute relevancy. They're being piloted, tested, and implemented with more sustainable value than was ever intended. Manufacturing is really being liberated. All these solutions have legs to travel up the chain and really revolutionize production, and fast. How might this all end up? It's easy to envision by looking at what a store in the future might look like. <laughs> they won't just be a destination for the product, but also its origin. Gone will be the endless layers of bureaucracy, of waste. We'll be able to produce more anatomically correct, size-specific, similar to the period when I started my career during the dinosaur, all without waste, inventory, logistics, and resources, all being made to order specifically as needed. This is honestly around the corner and will likely evolve similar into the way our mobile phone evolves so quickly and just as fast. The technologies are ready here and they're integrating at lightning speed. But one of the most formidable obstacles to overcome is the internet, is the interest and investment in the current system. It's evolved over time and added endless layers, and there are businesses in themselves and an economy unto its own. Only a total shock or shakeup can change that, and that has, in fact, has arrived, and it's in the form of blockchain. We all know blockchain from its application in crypto, but it's really, really so much more. Simply put, it's a digital ledger 
that is open source, totally secure, as well as self-governing. It's free from monopolization or corruption. Instead of being centrally controlled by one body, it uses peer-to-peer -peer controls for equal and real-time access. Each step is part of a digital timestamp, much like a fingerprint. Whether it's a smart contract, digital notary, proof of sustainability, even design copyrights, or even the product's origin, it covers absolutely everything as well as integrates it all. All this could easily be applied to other things such as logistics, manufacturing, finance, validations and accreditations of any type. From concept to consumer and maybe even beyond, blockchain could even be designed for the product's afterlife and actually maintain or, or give cons consumers uh, benefits for recycling or re reusing or donating products. In blockchain, the ethos itself is centralized, but not the interactions, which is the key difference. This takes away endless layers of bureaucracy that cause inefficiency and inflation. It frees up the product from all the compromise and hindrance that have evolved to now. It really does plant the seeds of the future and make that store of the future a lot more likely and coming fast. But now you've probably noticed that the solutions don't really address the problem at its root, but patch it on the back end. These new tools, though, they do. They address it from the very onset. They reboot and force the system to change, not from the top down, but from the bottom up, organically, naturally, the way they should always happen. And it, we here in, in Guangdong are in the heart of manufacturing to nurture and evolve all these things in good time. We can do it without coercion. We can do it with mandates and use the ingenuity of the market. The mother of invention truly is necessity. Thank you.